To begin with, we'll focus on some points of the topic we studied at the last lecture. As you have already learned, four different peoples invaded England. First came the Celts in the 6th century BC, then the Romans in the 1st century AD. They were followed by the Anglo-Saxons in the 5th century. After them came the Danes at the end of the 8th century. In the 11th century, England was invaded by the Normans. This was the fifth and the last invasion of England. Now we shall learn more about the way of life of the Normans and the changes they brought to England. William's initial desire was to work with the old Anglo-Saxon aristocracy. Having failed, he set out to create a new elite that would be loyal to him and ensure his position as King of England. That was secured by two things, castles and knights to mend them. The most famous of all the castles was the Tower of London. William I organized the government of England on the system that had been successful in Normandy, the feudal system based on the ownership of land. He granted land confiscated from the defeated aristocracy to 170 of his followers, who became thereby his tenants-in-chief. The grants of land were usually scattered through several shires. Collectively, each group of lands was called an owner, and each owner consisted of several smaller units called manors, divided among the 5,000 knights who had fought at Hastings. A knight had to swear loyalty to his lord. Each tenant-in-chief had two groups of knights, one consisting of those who were permanently part of his household, and a second one including those who came in return for land. The lords themselves had to swear loyalty to the king and to supply knights for his service. The common people belonged to the knight on whose manor they lived. They had to serve as farm workers but not as soldiers. There was also a small class of freemen who didn't have to work on the knight's farm. William was a strong king and the system worked. The trouble was that under weaker ruler the system could break down, leading to private castles and armies. The same revolution was applied to the Anglo-Saxon church. In Normandy, William controlled all the appointments of bishops, abbots, filling them with his own friends and relations. Bishops and abbots from before 1066 either died or were deposed. They were replaced by Normans and had to render the king rent in the form of armed knights. Together, the tenants-in-chief, bishops and abbots made up the new ruling class. For the higher clergy, being educated, were essential for the running of the government. In these changes, William was aided by a new archbishop of Canterbury, Lanfranc. Both believed that priests should be celibate. More significant for the future was the creation of special courts to deal with church cases only. All the lords had the right to attend the king's council, and it was his duty to ask their advice. William held council meetings nearly every day, wherever he happened to be. Three times a year he held a ceremonial council for Christian feasts and wore his crown. In Winchester for Easter, in London for Whitson, and mm, in Gloucester for Christmas. Then every lord had to attend. Winchester Castle was still the seat of government. Here William set up his government office, which controlled the collection of taxes and kept account of all expenses. From this office, 
men were sent out in 1086 to make a detailed rec record <clears throat> of all the wealth of England, for William, fearing invasion from Denmark, wanted to extract the maximum in taxation. The result was the Doomsday Book, which gives us a complete description of the country. The book occupies 400 double-sided pages and paints a picture of a country where virtually the entire population was engaged in agriculture, with little or no industry or commerce and few towns. William's reign saw a wave of new building in the beautiful style called Norman or Romanesque. The, Ren the Romanesque style was fully developed by about 1100, becoming the accepted style for church buildings throughout Europe with marked regional variations. In England, soon after the Norman conquest, work began on the cathedrals of Canterbury, Lincoln, and Winchester, and the churches of St. Albans, uh, Ely, and Worcester. However, only parts of these buildings have survived. They were all largely rebuilt in the 12th, 18th, uh, 14th centuries. The finest Norman building to survive in England is uh, Durham Cathedral, begun in 1093 and completed in 1133. The style made use of massive uh, thick walls, huge columns and lofty vaults. There were small windows and doors. The round arch became established at the basis of the church interior. Some of the churches were indeed very ornate, <coughs> with decorated pillars and carved doorways. As for domestic architecture, there were manor houses and castles. In early Norman England, the hall, together with a few outbuildings about a courtyard, constituted the entire commendation of the manor house. The first castles had a mount or moat with a single defensive four-story tower and a bailey that is a fortified outer wall initially made of wood and later of stone. In modern England, remains of more than 3,000 Norman mounts can be found. The most famous of the early Norman towers is the White Tower of London, begun in 1078. Slightly later came circular shell keeps like that at Windsor Castle. In the mid-12th century, the style changed under the influence of the Crusades. A fine, a fine example of the new style is Carnesbrook Castle, built about 1180, which was used as a setting for the film based on Ivanhoe by Walter Scott. The tower or the keep was retained as a lordly residence. This was surrounded with a stone curtain wall with solid half-round towers along its length. Rings of concentric defenses were to be the future of the castle form. By the second half of the 12th century, the castle had already become primarily a domestic residence, but with built-in uh, precautions for protection against social unrest. For the invaders, the conquest of England was a remarkable achievement and enduring at that. For the native population, it was a cruel and humiliating defeat, which swept their civilization away. The new aristocracy saw its first loyalty not to the land they had conquered, but to Normandy. For four centuries to come, English kings were also to be continental rulers, and the wealth of England was expanded in wars aimed at acquiring, defending, and sustaining a mainland, mainland empire. The state which William I created called for strong kings. Fortunately, he was succeeded by two of his sons who were just such men, but disaster 
was to strike later, when his grandson sits the throne. The crown passed first to the king's second son, William Rufus, next to his fourth son, Henry I, and finally to his grandson, Stephen. Stephen was a weak king, so the result was anarchy. Some of the barons went over to Matilda, the daughter of Henry I. Others were loyal to Stephen. Verse, the barons began to fight private wars with each other. Before his death in 1154, uh, Stephen adopted Henry, Matilda's son, as his heir. Henry's father was Geoffrey Plantagenet, Count of Anjou, Maltida's second husband, and his wife was Alina from Aquitaine. So when he uh, came to the throne as Henry II, he held enormous empire, including England, Normandy, Brittany, Anjou, Aquitaine, and called the Angevin Empire. Henry II was the first of 13 Plantagenet kings who were to rule England for 300 years. He was universally respected as a just and wise king. He was the first literate king after the conquest, being able both to read and write. Henry set out to restore the power of the crown and in so doing laid the foundations of the system of government that was to last for centuries. These developments came about partly because the king, having always to be on the move, needed to leave officers he could trust behind him. So successful was he in the case of England that he was able to absent himself for several years at a time, and yet order and justice were maintained. Castles illegally constructed by the barons were demolished and replaced by manor houses. A Nats feudal service of 40 days was of little use to Henry, who needed regular soldiers to guard his French possessions. He encouraged his lords to pay special um, tax instead of sending him uh, their knights. This allowed him to hire professional soldiers, while the knights remained at home and improved their manners. Henry II is best remembered for his reform of the courts and the system of law. He sent out, sent out his own judges to make regular tours of the country, and any free man could take a case to them if he didn't trust the local courts. Most important was Henry's jury system. In Henry's times, the jurors were witnesses themselves, and no man could be tried unless a jury of 12 men um, swore that there was a true case against him. This was real progress. In England now, there are two kinds of law, statute law, that is acts made by parliament, and common law. Common law was first collected together by Henry II. It reflects the changing uh, customs of the land, which have been expressed in court judgments through the ages. Henry believed so strongly in the rule of law that he kept no army in England, but laid down the exact weapons and armor that every free man should hold ready for the defense of his country. What proved a real problem was the king's relationship with the judge and the man who was to become first his chancellor and then his archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Beckett. Many practices of the Church courts were an insult to Henry's rule of law, for they often let even murderers go unpunished. Besides, by the close of the 11th century, the church was undergoing a revolution, asserting the dignity of the priestly office and the power of the popes as direct successors of Christ through Saint Peter. The Anglo-Saxon and the Norman church had been at the service of the state. The kings were sacred beings and appointed both bishops and abbots. 
The king presented them an appointment with a staff and a ring, symbols of their office. The staff, called a creuse, symbolized their role as the shepherd of their flock. They then did homage to the king and received their lands. The struggle to separate the church from the control of the state was to become focused on the one act of the king and giving the office holder his stubborn reign. In the reign of Henry I, a compromise was reached. The king no longer gave the cleric his reign and staff, but retained the right to receive his homage. But neither side was happy. The struggle between the church and the state reached a crisis in the reign of Henry II. When the king came to the throne, he appointed Thomas Beckett to the major administrative post of Chancellor. Beckett and the king became great friends. In Beckett, the king saw a means of tidying up relations between church and state. He believed that with his friend as Archbishop of Canterbury, the situation could return to how, to how it had been just after the conquest. In 1161, the opportunity came with the death of the Archbishop. On the 2nd of June, 1162, Beckett was ordained, was ordained priest and on the following day appointed Archbishop of Canterbury. After that, he immediately resigned all his secular offices and changed his style of life to self-denial and humility. Henry, however, failed to recognize that times had changed and his old friend had been trained in the new canon law in which the clergy were exempt from lay interference. Henry decided that criminal uh, clerks must in future be tried by lay courts, for in a church court the worst sentence was to defraud clerk. Public opinion supported the king, but most bishops agreed. But Thomas refused and fled abroad. For six years, uh, there followed endless attempts to bring about a reconciliation. In July 1170, Beckett returned to England. His uh, first act was to excommunicate all the bishops who had taken part in the coronation of Henry's son as successor in Beckett's absence. The king was seized with fury, crying in an unguarded moment, who will rid me of this law-born priest? In all too eager response, four knights slipped out of the room, set sail for Kent, and on the 29th of December murdered the archbishop in his own cathedral. Beckett's tomb in the crypt of Canterbury Cathedral became a shrine at which miracles occurred, and soon after, in 1173, the Pope canonized him. Canterbury swiftly became the most popular center of pilgrimage in medieval England. The king himself did penance, walking barefoot through the streets of Canterbury, and after that, gave himself over to being flogged by his bishops and monks. The story of this conflict between Henry II and Thomas Beckett, which probably hasn't only political, but an important human dimension, been also a conflict between personal loyalty and personal convictions, is so dramatic that it served as a source of inspiration for the famous writer Thomas Turns Eliot, who made a verse play murder in the cathedral in 1935. Yet Henry's inheritance was splendid, good government in terms of peace, law and order, on a scale unknown to any other country in Western Europe at that time. Nothing is more striking than the stability of England at the time of Henry's death. So strong was the government that it could withstand the fact that the next king, Richard I, who ruled for a decade, 
only visited the country twice, once for three months and a second time only for two. He was dubbed lion-hearted in tribute to his uh, daredevil bravery. England was looked upon as little more than a source for money to pay for the crusade on which he embarked. When Richard was killed, the Angevin Empire passed to John. This time it was a far from glorious legacy. War with an increasingly powerful French king, financial crisis in England caused by the wars as well as the late king's crusade and ransom money. Whatever Richard's shortcomings, he had been respected and evoked loyalty. On the reign of King Richard, I would like to finish my lecture. Добрый день! Сегодня речь пойдет не о непосредственно о языковом оформлении текста при выполнении задания раздела единого государственного экзамена по английскому языку «Письменная речь». Незнание простых правил орфографии, невнимательность при формулировании письменного высказывания, игнорирование требований к разноуровневым письменным заданиям может привести к потере баллов за раздел «Письменная речь ЕГЭ». Такой совокупный критерий языковое оформление текста используется для оценивания электронного письма личного характера. Лексика, грамматика, орфография, пунктуация являются составными частями данного критерия оценивания задания базового уровня. Умение создавать электронное письмо личного характера в ответ на письмо стимул зарубежного друга по переписке. Максимальные два балла выставляются работе, в которой используемый словарный запас и грамматические структуры соответствуют базовому уровню сложности задания. Орфографические пунктационные ошибки практически отсутствуют. То есть допускаются 1 две лексико-грамматические ошибки и, или 1 две орфографические и пунктационные ошибки. Для оценивания же задания 38, развернутое письменное высказывание с элементами рассуждения на основе таблицы или диаграммы, критериев больше, а языковое оформление текста оценивается так. Отдельно лексика, максимально 3 балла, отдельно грамматика, максимально 3 балла и орфография, пунктация вместе, высший балл 2 балла. Это критерии оценивания 3, 4 и 5 соответственно. На что здесь нужно обратить особое внимание? Это на формулировку критериев, которые включают фразу «высокого уровня сложности». Словарный запас соответствует высокому уровню сложности, грамматические средства – также соответствует высокому уровню сложности задания. Допущение количества ошибок, как вы видите, минимальное. Одна лексическая, одна две грамматических на максимальные три балла, одна орфографическая, одна пунктационная. Согласно кодификатору проверяемых требований к результатам освоения основной образовательной программы среднего общего образования и элементов содержания для проведения единого государственного экзамена по английскому языку, Выпускники должны владеть лексическими, грамматическими и орфографическими навыками в рамках лексико-грамматического минимума соответствующего уровня. Согласно описанию лексической стороны речи, необходимо употреблять в речи наиболее распространенные устойчивые словосочетания, реплики клише речевого этикета, характерные для культуры и англоязычных стран. Например, «out of order», «it goes without saying», It is beyond understanding. On cloud nine, if it is informal speech, it's a down point. It's hard to overestimate. Thumbs up. Write back soon, so we shall wait and see, and so on. Далее перечисляются аффиксы для образования глаголов, существительных, прилагательных, наречий, а также отрицательные префиксы. Все нужно тренировать и практиковать. Practice makes perfect. В грамматической стороне речи необходимо правильно употреблять условные предложения реального а, и нереального характера. Conditional one, conditional two. If I were you, I definitely start learning Chinese, for example. Необходимо уметь правильно употреблять различные коммуникативные типы предложений. Утвердительные, вопросительные, общие, специальные, альтернативные, разделительные вопросы в present, simple, future, simple, past, simple. Simple, present perfect, present continuous, отрицательные, побудительные предложения в утвердительной и отрицательной формах. 
распространенные и нераспространенные простые предложения, в том числе с несколькими обстоятельствами, следующими в определенном порядке. Например, нужно усвоить, что дополнение следует раньше, чем обстоятельства, а обстоятельства места предшествуют обстоятельству времени. Если в предложении есть только одно дополнение, то оно стоит сразу после сказуемого «I've got your email message». Если в предложении есть и прямое, и косвенное дополнение без предлога, то прямое стоит после косвенного, например, «I've sent my friend an email». При наличии предложенного косвенного дополнения и прямого дополнения сначала используется прямое дополнение, а затем косвенное. I've sent an email to my friend. Что касается употребления обстоятельств в английском предложении, то советуем запомнить шутливое сравнение по аналогии со знаменитой игрой «Что, где, когда». В английском предложении обстоятельства следуют в следующем порядке «Как, где, когда». То есть при наличии всех видов обстоятельств на первое место ставится обстоятельство образа действия, на второе – обстоятельство места, а на третье – обстоятельство времени. How, where, when. I bought this rare book by chance in a little bookshop last Sunday. Хотя вы знаете, что обстоятельство времени может стоять и на самом первом месте в начале предложения. Например, Last Sunday I bought this rare book by chance in a little bookshop. При наличии нескольких обстоятельств времени более точные указания на время ставятся раньше более общих. Например, I sent an email at 5 o'clock yesterday. I was born in Amavie on the 1st of September 2007. Что касается порядка употребления нескольких прилагательных в одном предложении, рекомендуется запомнить следующую последовательность и, конечно же, практиковаться. Сначала всегда используется opinion adjective, оценочные прилагательные мнения, такие как fantastic, excellent, good, nice, or ugly, disgusting, а затем фактически прилагательные fact adjectives, huge, middle-aged, blue, and so on. Очередность прилагательных такая. How big, small or tall, how old, old, young, middle-aged, what color, white, black, where from, Russian, Chinese, what it is made of, wooden, glass. For example, I see a cozy, tiny, old, white, wooden cottage. Логическая схема для запоминания такая. От тех слов, которые легко изменить сначала, они стоят в начале. Opinion adjectives. Вы знаете, мнение может меняться, как погода. А в конце, например, материал происхождения трудно а, или невозможно их изменить. Так что известное выражение «старая добрая Англия» будет звучать в английском варианте «отнюдь не old good England», а «good old England», так как мнение на первом месте «good», а фактическое прилагательное на второе место. Итак, «good old England». Будьте внимательны. Обратите внимание на следующие требования к грамматической стороне речи. Правильное употребление разнообразных видовременных форм действительного и страдательного залога, первого и второго причастий, фразовых глаголов, фразеологизмов, модальных глаголов, множественного числа существительных и так далее поможет вам заработать более высокий балл. Помимо наиболее употребительных временных форм, действительного залога present simple, future simple, past simple, present, past continuous, present perfect. Необходимо правильно употреблять в речи глаголы в следующих формах действительного залога present perfect, continuous, present perfect, past perfect, continuous. He's been studying chemistry for four years, for example. He'd been studying chemistry for four years before applying to university. How long have you been studying German, for example? А для повторения употребления в речи артикля с географическими названиями, именами собственными, предлагается вам небольшая шпаргалка. 
Несмотря на достаточную натренированность заданий в письменных работах базового и высокого уровня, при проверке пробных письменных работ в формате ЕГЭ наблюдается достаточно большое количество лексико-грамматических и орфографических ошибок. Ряд из них грубый, как, например, порядок слов в повествовательных предложениях, порядок слов в прямом и косвенном вопросах, неправильное употребление видовременных форм глагола в вопросах и ответах, использование прилагательных вместо наречий, а также э, ошибки в правописании. При подготовке к экзамену необходимо тренировать базовые речевые умения и языковые навыки для любого вида, любой формы письменного общения. И в целом развивать коммуникативную компетенцию, умение смыслового чтения, логическое мышление. Последовательная, осмысленная работа над письменным заданием обеспечит достижение не только предметных, но и метапредметных и личностных результатов. So that's all for today. Good luck. Bye for now. For better or for worse, English is blessed with articles. This causes a considerable amount of confusion for speakers of most of the world's other languages, who seem to get all as well without them. Uh, the good news is that English began dropping the complex case system. Although greatly simplified, English article usage still poses a number of challenges to speakers of other European languages. We are going to discuss the usage of articles there and zero with proper nouns. The first known use of proper noun was in the 15th century. We all know that nouns are one of the parts of speech in the English language. There are many types of nouns that we use in daily communication. In English grammar, a proper noun is a noun belonging to the class of words used as names for specific or unique individuals, events or places and may include real or fictional characters and setting. Proper nouns are not typically preceded by articles or other determiners, but there are numerous exceptions, such as the Brox or the 4th of July. Furthermore, most proper nouns are singular, but again there are exceptions, as in the United States. The main reason for distinguishing between common nouns and proper nouns is that to help with classification and capitalization. While proper nouns are almost always capitalized, common nouns never are. While proper nouns indicate a specific class of identity, common nouns provide a generic uh, designation common nouns do not specially reference any one particular person, place or thing, but rather the collective understanding of all of, of the persons, places or things associated with the word. A simple way of avoiding that mistake is to look carefully of your noun. Is it specific? Is it taking about one particular person, things, place, etc.? If not, then keep it lowercase. Proper names include names and surnames of people, specific people, days of the week, holidays, names of streets, roads, various buildings, attractions, public places, names of the educational and other institutions, names of various kinds of organizations, names of newspaper and magazines, historical and astronomical names, names of works of art, and many others. Articles with such words are combined in a unique way. The rules given will hopefully help you master those three key articles. Words indicating a family member, mom, dad, grandma, etc., should have an initial capital letter only if the word is unsaid the same way as the natural name. Proper noun, can you please ask dad what time we are living today? Otherwise, it should be have lowercase letters, common noun. Has dad decided to leave early today? If a family title precedes a name, it is a proper noun. Example, there are Aunt Vicky or Uncle Ron. 
in the case of official job uh, titles, uh, there is usually dropped if there is only one such incompatible and given a uh, time only one person holding this position. For example, Justin Trudeau was the Prime Minister of Canada during the COVID-19 crisis. Margaret II, uh, the Queen of Denmark. However, persons and unique things or ideas are identified by their names. For example, the Empire State Building. Job titles are not considered proper nouns. However, they should be capitalized if they precede a person name. President George Washington. George Washington was the president. The president of the United States is the head of the state. We are not talking about a specific president, such as uh, John Biden. So, president, despite in this gravitas, remains low cases. If we wanted to capitalize the word president, we would have to turn it into a proper noun. To do so, all we have to do is attract it to the name of the president. The current head of state is President Joe Biden. Dates and calendar days. In English grammar, also, the months and days of the week are proper nouns, like September and Thursday. However, the seasons are not and are thus not capitalized. For example, September is my favorite month because it marks the beginning of autumn. Seasons should only be capitalized if used as part of a specific name. What and Matt and Penelope organized the spring fling. Schools, colleges, universities, academies. No article is needed if the third, um, first word is the name uh, in the place or institution is named after famous people or city followed by a noun. For most places consisting of uh, just the name of a person or the name of a person place. Mm, Fort High School. Boston College, Moscow State University, Cambridge University, Harvard University, London University. There is useful there is uh, a preposition of a, as a part of the possessive construction. The University of Oxford, the University of Cambridge, but the George University, the John Hopkins University. As for organizations, governments, committees, parties, associations, foundations, uh, clubs and banks, the definite article there is used, for example, the United Nations, the UN, the Congress of the United States, the Parliament of Great Britain, the British Parliament, the Bush administration, but the Bush's administration, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FIB, the Democratic Party, the Teachers Association, the Ford Foundation, the Cotton Club, but Congress, Parliament, the Senate. Uh, there is used for museums, galleries, monuments, memorials, cathedrals, Palace's place of interest, the British Museum, the National Gallery, the Tretico Gallery, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the Pyramids, uh, the Kremlin, the Great Wall of China, the Cathedral of St. Basil, but no article, Stonehenge, Beckenham Palace, St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey. But if a building or institution has a unique name, but not in uh, someone's honor, there we use uh, there, for example, the Winter Palace. They is needed for halls, centers, buildings, houses, towers, theaters, and libraries. The, the Royal Albert Hall, the Capitol Building, the Sydney of Opera House, the Tower of London, the Bolshoi Theater, the British Library, the Lenin Library. If a store, cafe, restaurant, bank, hotel, or any organization is named after uh, someone's name with the ending S or apostrophe S, the article is not needed. For example, McDonald. 
No article is usually needed in front of uh, companies, corporations, businesses, firms, banks, uh, names, for example, Ford, General Motors, Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, Procter & Gamble. But if the name obtains the word company, then the definite article there can be used. The Procter & Gamble company, the Food Motor company, the uh, Carnegie Company of New York, the World Bank, etc. A rare exception to the capitalization rule of proper nouns is when referring to the names of brands or brand uh, markets products that begin with a lowercase letter. For example, it is correct to refer to the Apple Company's brand of uh, tablets as iPads. Uh, this is used for names of vehicles, the ships, trains, and spacecrafts, um, the Titanic, the Orient Express, the flying Scotman Challenger II, the Enterprise. To give added punch, articles are often dropped in the um, titles of books, poems, songs, plays, films, music, and other words of art. For example, if gone with the wind, queen, but the lion king. Uh, the article there is usually used if the name is in the plural. The Rolling Stones, the Beatles, but who, the who, and zero if uh, it is in the singular. Uh, for example, Abba, queen. When transliterating into Russian, the definite article is lost. Beatles. Rolling Stones. Even if an article exists in the original title, as in the J. Talking, The Lord of the Rings, people tend to omit this when making reference to work. J. Talking's The Lord of the Rings, people tend to omit this when making reference to the work in everyday speech or writing. Have you read Lord of the Rings right now? Johnny into Hell sounds even more thrilling than the journey into hell. This is usually for many large organizations and institutions, not commercial enterprises, including those with initials that are normally spelled out with abbreviations organization. The article is not needed, but with their full names it is useful. The acronym is an abbreviation pronounced as a single word. Acronyms are treated in the same way as regular names, proper nouns, and so do not require any articles. With such proper names, uh, the article is not used. Uh, UNESCO, NATO, UNIFES, abbreviation that have became independent words, however, with full names, the article is needed. The United States Nations, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the United Nations Children's Emergency Fund. In contrast, they is generally used with abbreviation whose individual letters are separately pronounced. Initials, nationalism, it would the... Whose individual letters are separately pronounced, initialism, if it would be used with the uh, expanded form. She was born in the UK, but now lives in the US. N note that whether to use the before an abbreviation is a matter of convention and established usage. The documentary was air uh, both on the uh, PBS and the BBC. Abbreviations can help avoid repetition and improve clarity. They are also useful when space is limited. If the acronym is used objectively, th use there as appropriate example. The NATO 
members who obtains from voting are Germany and Poland. NATO describes the noun members. The article there is required to modify the noun, the members, the NATO members. Abbreviation are not generally used to start a sentence in formal writing. Acronyms, however, which are abbreviations, pronounces words, are acceptable in this position. With acronyms of common nouns, which refer to a class of things, use they if it would be useful with the full form, but not otherwise. Uh, reinstall the, mm, the uh, doors on your company, the disk operating system, TIP. While use of the article the depends on convention and accepted usage. Use of the article A or N depends on how an abbreviation is pronounced. Uh, example, as NATO official, but an NBA players a STEM project, but an source. Note. Whether they is used before an abbreviation depends on convention and uh, established usage rather than in a fixed set of rules. For example, uh, uh, the BBC, but PBS, the ink, the asoba. Sometimes uh, they will be omitted before an initialism even if it will be used with the expanded them. Example, the World Health Organization, but the WHO. The same rules for the use of uh, definite and indefinite articles apply to acronyms. The APA, the American Psychological Association, the APA requires website addresses in bibliographies. APA refers to the American Psychological Association. They is used because it is proper identification viable noun, but a goals, a mm, geostationary operational environmental satellite, a goals was used for this research. Goals refers to a geostationary operational environment satellite. A is used here because there are several of these and specific one has not yet been. No article is needed in front of roads, streets, parks, national parks, and uh, museums, parks, gardens, squares. For example, Gorky Street, but the High Street, the Stand, the Mall, mm, the Arbat. National Park, Disneyland, Trafalgar Square, but the Cathedral Square, uh, the Montreal Botanic Garden. No article is needed in front of airports, uh, Hintro Airport, British Airways Airport, but the Shirimetiva International uh, Airport. Hotels. No article is needed if the possessive case with the name of the founder or owner is used. Queen's Hotel, Joe's Inn, Ben's Pub. This is used in hotel names if the first word in the title is in the objective function without the possessive case. That is the Hilton Hotel, the Rich Hotel, the Grand Hotel. Article there is used uh, for bridges names, uh, for example, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, the George Washington Bridge, no article is needed for Tower Bridge and London Bridge and Westminster Bridge. Note, if in Canada we want to use the in front of things names uh, when speaking or writing about them, but the names themselves do not include them on the signs. The Alex Fraser Bridge, the Portman Bridge. Uh, they are used for newspapers, that is the New York Times, the Guardian, uh, etc. But today, Daily Express, Newsday, Chicago Tribune. No article is needed for names of Russian language newspapers. For foreign newspapers, the moda. Uh, they do not used for magazines. For example, uh, uh, writers. Uh, they do not use for magazines. Reader's Digest, uh, Better Home and Gardens, Forbes, Newsweek, New Musical Express. 
uh, kind driver, but the New Yorker, the Economist, the Journal of Psychology. Note, the definite article is part of the name, the New York Times. The definite article is not part of the name, the Los Angeles Times. Conferences, documents, awards, prizes, orders, uh, medals, these used for conference and document names if the first name in the title is in the objective function without the possessive case. The Moscow Summit, the Yalta Conference, the Charter of the United Nations, the U and Charter, the Declaration of Independence, the Truman Doctrine, but Truman's program. They is also used for awards prizes, orders, medals, the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize for Peace, the Academy Award, the Granny Award, the Order of Friendship. Note, the plus name of the award equals the name of the award. For example, Max Planck received mm, the mm, Nobel Prize for Physics in 1819. Bernard Russell received the uh, 1950 no Nobel Prize for Literature. Oliver Stohr received the Academy Award for Best Screenplay in 1978. A N plus name of the word equals one of such a word. Example, uh, Mary Brickwood received a special Academy Award in uh, 1976. Jen Nixon won an Academy Award for Best Actor for his performance in the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, the names of religious and other holidays are used without the article. Christmas, New York Days, New Year, Easter, Memorial Day, but the 4th of July, uh, the Cherry Festival, the Jazz Festival. Language names are used without the article. Russian, Spanish, French, Arabic, Chinese, English, British English, American English, Australian English, Canadian English, but if the full name of the language is specified, English, French, etc., uh, there in the definite article must be specified the English language, the Chinese language. For example, Canada has two official languages, English and French. Do you speak Spanish? Diana is studying the history of the English language. Uh, populations, inhabitants, nationalities. We put an article when we need to proudly say about our citizenship and belonging to a certain country or nationality. I am a Russian. The native speakers themselves speak about nationality in ordinary colloquial speech without the article. She is Canadian. We tend to use no article when they are in general, plural, Europeans, Africans, Australians, Russians. Use the article to emphasize your belonging to your nationality. Uh, the use of the article depends on what the ending of the nationality is. Uh, nationalities that have the ending I-N a-N, E-A-N have an article, for example, an American, a Canadian, an Australian, a Russian. Note, the article there is put when it comes to a specific group of people of a certain nationality. Article there is needed uh, when uh, they are in plural to single out as a group of people, the Arabs, the Danes, Use the articles to emphasize your belonging to your nationality. Sorry. Keep your English burning. Summary. Use carefully articles in oral and written speech. There are certain rules for using the articles there with proper names and titles, but uh, there are also a huge number of exceptions. Most articles' usage does, in fact, have a reasonably logical explanations. Even native speakers are not always sure in which name the article is needed and in which it is missing. If you are 
uh, uncertain, please monitor usage in the media or consult a dictionary.